Welcome to Delling Pool, a Breitbart.com podcast. Here is the podcast host, James Delling Pool. Welcome to the Delling Pool podcast with me, James Delling Pool. And I am so, so happy about this week's guest, as you're going to be as well. I've, I've been trying to track her down for, for like, I mean, she's a friend, so it should be easy. But somehow we never got it together, did we? It, it's, it's Sarah Vine, uh, otherwise known as Mrs. Gove. Um, Wednesday witch. Wednesday, Wednesday witch. Um, and Westminster wag. Yeah, Sarah. But apart from everything else, you've probably got the 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 kind of the blue ribbon of jobs in journalism. I have. Yes. I mean, it, it's the it's the people Linda, kill for my job. They, they do. They have they do. Done. Yes. Yeah. It's 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 um it's the Linda Lee Potter job. On on the Daily Mail. On the Daily Mail. Which, on the Wednesday witch. Yes. You, you you cannot go higher. No, you can't. No, or lower. In fact. I mean, I mean, when you were a child, did you? Well, I mean, how how what, what's the age age gap between you and Lindley Poppet? Did did you read her stuff? Uh, no, because I was living in Italy, so I had no knowledge of Lindley Potter at all. Right until um, until I started um, becoming a journalist, and and then of course she was legendary. So so I didn't grow up with Lindley. For for the benefit of our special American friend and our special South African friend, our special Australian friend, who may not have been exposed to the Daily Mail, just the one friend. Yeah, oh. we, but they're very special. Okay. Um, what what does it entail? Uh, well, it's it's the when it's it's a it's a page. It's not a column. I had to point this out. It's it, in in tabloid tradition. It's not a column. I have I have a page, which is very different. Uh, it's a page on a Wednesday in the Daily Mail. Usually page fifteen, sometimes page seventeen, and it's a sort of aggregation of all of the events of the week, um, uh, as a sort of opinion column. So I will write about whatever is most present in the news mind, the hive mind of the news from my own perspective. And then sometimes I'll just write randomly about something that's not necessarily in the news, but most it's a multi-item column. So it has one lead piece, which is about 650 words, and then lots of other pieces which are meant to be hilarious. Yeah. Which is quite hard. That's and actually the hardest bit. The easiest bit is writing the main piece. You have to sort of get your finger on the pulse yes. of, of what sort of Middle England. Yes, you're trying. You're trying to sort of what you're trying to do is to um, capture the feelings of Middle England, but without being too sort of obviously uh, mirroring them. Sort of putting a bit of a spin on them. Uh, uh, you're taking them maybe one step further than they would comfortably go. Right. Um, in terms of how they might think about the stuff that's happening. That's my daughter opening a packet of biscuits. By the way. Can I say we like Sorry. we like ambient noise. In yes. This. We, we like. Hello, Beatrice. We like the sound of kind of real life being yes. lived. Yes. This is as my the podcast my, goes on. My teenager who's come to get snacks. Hey, we can embarrass the teenagers by talking about them and on on the podcast because yeah. because they love that, don't they? Teenage they do. Girls. They do. Yeah. So before I came to see you, my mother, who is has read the Daily Mail for years and is obviously a goddess. Well, well, because you know what I'm about to say. Yes. She said, "Oh, did you read Sarah Vine after the royal wedding?" Oh, she was so right. She said what we were all thinking. Uh, yes, she, that that's terrible, isn't it? That's it is. that's it. Basically, that means she's incredibly rude. So she says all the things that we wouldn't, we won't say because we're nice, polite people. But Sarah Vine will say them because she's rude. Yes, that's that's what I try to do. I don't always do it. Quite often, readers, I get a lot of readers' letters saying, "Normally, I agree with everything you say, but on this particular occasion, I completely disagree." But I think that's quite good. I think the idea is you you want people to wake up and you want to sort of pique their imagination. And, uh, and you know, and maybe think about something in a slightly different way. I mean, you can't just, the column can't just be a sort of general rant about, it. there has to be, it, there's more to it than that. And what's brilliant about the column is the fact that it's brilliantly edited by the people at the Daily Mail, and particularly the editor, Paul Dacre, who's a genius, in my humble opinion, and who is brilliant at... Uh, who edit, ed, edits his newspaper forensically every single day, unlike most newspaper editors these days, and who um, has a proper sort of in-depth uh, attention to detail and knowledge of what's going on in his, own, in his own newspaper. And he is the person who makes sure that we all go one step further every day. And that's why the mail is so good, because we're, we're always, every single day, you're pushed almost to your limit and then slightly beyond. He always tries to get you to go a little bit further. And that's why I like working for him, because 
I've written columns before for other newspapers and it's lovely. And But what you do is you file your column at about three o'clock in the afternoon and the editor says, thanks very much. And then they might come back to you with a couple of changes, but broadly speaking, they leave it as it is. But on the Daily Mail, they will they will come back to you and say, that is a brilliant column. But what about if you went this bit further or, th- or wrote this extra bit? Or have you thought about that? So they'll always push you to try and be, uh, you know, if you've written an eight, they'll always try to get you to write a ten. And that's what's really good about it. And it's not they're trying to influence what you say. That does not happen. But they're just trying to say, can you say that a bit more, be- a bit tiny bit better, a bit, better. A bit more better, yeah. a bit more better uh, uh, with, you know, can you, uh, there's, a, there's a sort of phrase that they often use, which is, can you just put more meat on those bones? Can you just go a little bit further in terms of your argument? Can you make it slightly more complex? Can you add in other things? Can you try a bit harder? Um, and so that for that reason, it's it's a it's a very stimulating place to work because you're never allowed to get away with it. There's never will this do. Do you know what I mean? Did, did you find with the with the royal wedding, which was tricky territory, in that there was a sort of a curve, wasn't there? There was the early stage where oh, they, she's lovely, isn't it just the best oh. couple in the world? Isn't it amazing yes. that that she's mixed race? Yes, and and she's Hollywood, yes. Hollywood glamour, and then but. There was a transitional point where yes. people were saying, "Yeah, but she's also an SJW, and, yes. she's, and they're going to divorce in, in yes. five years." Yes. How do, how do you how do you judge when the time to stick the knife in is? Well, um, I you can t- the good thing about working for Daily Mail is that you get the Daily Mail readers, right. and they are quite vocal, and they email a lot. So you start to know when the tide is turning, when you start to get emails from readers <laughs> saying, saying, I, you know, I'm not sure about this woman. I mean, are we sure? She's, they're very, um, they're quite, you know, they're quite vocal. And so you listen to your readers and I get lots and lots of, I mean, email is a brilliant thing for an, a, a, for a, um, a columnist because it's very immediate. Mm. And, and you establish, um, you know, they can just send you any, and, and people do tend to email very quick. It's much quicker than writing a letter, isn't it? In the olden days, you had to sit down and actually get a stamp and a pen and a yeah. piece of paper. Now you can just fire off an email um, on, your, on your way to work on the train or whatever. So I get a lot of, a lot of emails from readers and I listen to what they say. And, and I, that, that's very helpful. But also, I think you just have to, as a columnist, you have to slightly be prepared to put you, to stick your neck out. Yeah. I mean, that is your job. Your job is to, is to sniff the wind and be the first person to put their hand up and say, actually, you know, I, I, I'm not sure about this. Um, and, it, you know, because there's nothing worse than a columnist that just writes what every other columnist has already written two weeks ago, is yeah. there? And you're always trying to be ahead of the game in that respect. Have you ever um, made a, a, a terrible judgment call where you've sort of felt that, it's come back to bite you. God, not yet. No, no that's good. That's good. Is that that's terrible? Good. No, no. <laughs> but I, I imagine next you, week <laughs> you must get you must get so much hate. I on get loads Twitter, of hate on Twitter. I get loads of hate on Twitter. But the way but the way I deal with it is I switch off all the notifications that are not people who I follow. So I just put my things in my ears and say la 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 la. That's my attitude to Twitter. I, I, I just think there's no point. You can go mad. I mean, you, James, you feed the trolls appallingly. And you mustn't. You've just got to accept that these people are, <clears throat> A, they're disinhibited because they don't know you and they can't see you. So therefore, they're going to say things that they wouldn't dream of saying to somebody that was actually standing mm. in front of them. So automatically, everything is is much nastier than it should be. And B, I actually don't care what someone I've never met who lives in Arkansas thinks about me. I, I genuinely don't. I, people, no, but Is people in Arkansas probably would like you. Well, maybe they would. Or don't diss people of Arkansas. They're, <laughs> love, they're we nice, love Arkansas. They're, they're nice people. Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, there are people... Probably most of the hateful people come from London, actually. Let's face it. Most of them are just are just are just bots set up by Corbynistas yeah. to fire off one or two incredibly hateful things. I mean, they do send you some awful stuff. They do. Um, no. And I and that's why, that's why I started blocking... Um, my notifications because otherwise i just get loads of horrible horrible videos of dogs having sex with donkeys or whatever yeah. it is they send you the whole time oh totally no, as, as, as captain scott famously said on twitter great god this is an awful place i mean <laughs> it, it, it really is it but is what well, surprises me is though is the amount of um the amount of uh, credence it's given by people who really ought to know better well, that includes newspaper editors unfortunately yeah. they're so i mean twitter is a, a minority activity isn't yeah. it well, it is, and it's also dominated by a t- by a very clear and narrow political, you know, group. Um, you know, it's it's Corbyn just Easters, yeah. um, 
Uh, cybernats. Yeah. It's Ex- extremists They're all extreme. Generally. They're all people who are, they're all basically people who can't get a job somewhere normal because they're too mad. And so they go on Twitter. I mean, what do they do all day? Do they not have jobs? Do they not work? Uh, our previous week's guest, um, presuming, presuming that I run, run it before this one, um, Tom Holland, um, described this situation where he'd, he'd got into a Twitter storm and everyone was being completely horrible to him. And then he bumped into a friend and, and the friend said, how are you, Tom? And he said, oh, terrible. I mean, you know, I just they're, they're, they're tearing me to pieces on Twitter. The friend had not a clue. No, of course and not. And what he realised was Twitter doesn't no. matter. No, no, no. It's just, a, it's, it's like a sort of cesspool. You can either put your head in it and, and, and swallow, and swallow a, load of, yeah, a load of really unpleasant stuff. Or you can keep your head out of it and just, and just, it doesn't, it, you know, it doesn't, it is irrelevant. And that's why it's so depressing that it has such sway because it's not a real thing. It's, no. it's, it's a made up thing on the internet that doesn't exist in the real world. I mean, if these people at, were actually standing at my, outside my house with pitchforks, then yes, I'd be worried yeah. because obviously they'd then set fire to me, but they're not. They're, they're just, they're, 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 they are literally in, in the ether. Can I just defend myself briefly there against, against this charge that you laid against feeding the, trolls, the feeding trolls. Um, Number one, I don't have a life like you have. I mean, you're you're both a a, a mother and a successful columnist, so that's not so you you haven't got time to engage in this. No. Uh, plus, you're not a bloke as well, and I think no. I think there is a, a man thing that you have to go. And and B, it's kind. You know the scene in Live and Let Die mm. where he walks across the backs of the alligators mm-hmm. and they all go snap, 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 mm-hmm. snap. Mm-hmm. It's quite satisfying if you can walk across the backs of the alligators and they go snap, 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 and you don't die. Yeah, they're not real alligators though. So, 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 really, it's not. If you want to prove your masculinity, you should go and do something proper. In the abs, we haven't got a world war at the moment. There are loads. You I could, can't. There, there are loads of wars you could go and join. I'm, I'm in my fifties, Sarah. <laughs> I, I, that, a... that, that ship has. <laughs> that ship may have sailed. That ship may have, may have, may have sailed. But I, I, I do totally agree with you. That... But I have discovered that the one thing about Twitter is that whatever trouble you're in on Twitter, if you just switch off the internet for three days, it goes away. Yeah, that's the thing. I have in the past, I think, got into so-called Twitter spats with people. I can't remember who. And what I tend to do is just turn off Twitter, ignore, ignore, ignore. Everybody gets themselves in an incredible, massive lather. And then because they because it has Twitter has the attention span of a gnat. I mean, literally, whatever's happening to you on Twitter, the one thing you can absolutely be 100 percent sure of is that somebody else will have it happen to them in about half an hour. And then everyone will forget about you. Well, while we've been away from from kind of Twitter world, we've we, we've been kind of kind of on holiday, and I've noticed that before I went away, Roseanne Roseanne Barr was the the surprise comedy success of yeah. the year. Her 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 new se- uh, comedy series um, showed that there is a Trump audience out there, yeah. and and that, that that this is where TV should go. Yeah. Since then. I discovered that her career has completely yeah. been destroyed. She is dead. What has she done? She she said something in the tweet. I don't. I mean, it's, it's quite difficult to find out. It's something racist, apparently. But I'm thinking, what could she have said in 140 characters that would have been enough to destroy an entire it's, career? It, well, it's, it's uh, the, the key. The key thing is, is that, 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 that obviously people, obviously Twitter doesn't like her because she's a sort of. Um, white right wing woman making that's comedy and that's why they don't like her and so basically so she could have put out a tweet saying i like fairies and they would still have found a way for her to be in trouble the whole point is you know she's she's banned she's got to go because of what she is it's got nothing to do with what she said i'm sure i'm sure what she said may or may not have been particularly offensive but i but but, but there's a but there's a bigger agenda there and that's the agenda that twitter has which is that it will try and take down anything that it doesn't like i mean this is why it's had this sort of absurd you know, this is why it goes. Uh, this is why it goes after people like you know, Toby Young. You know, who 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 and and I get you know people will go through his tweets from a hundred years ago. My son was telling me about some footballer who'd been banned from ten games for a tweet that he had done when he was sixteen. He's now twenty four. I mean, the idea that you can't have a misspent youth or that you can't have a past—that's the thing that really upsets me about Twitter, and generally about the internet and about this sort of forensic kind of you know age that we live in where everything is photographed or videoed or whatever is that you know when we were young when you and i were young which was obviously a very long time ago ago. i barely remember um we did lots of stupid things but nobody was there to take a picture or to record it or to put it on a social media platform yes and to to, you know and and no one and you know 
I, I can't imagine how awful it must be to be a young person today when everything you do and all your mistakes are there to be to haunt you for the rest of your life. But this is not just a question. This is not a thing about Twitter uniquely. It's, it's a thing about social media you know, in general, which is that it it, sh- it 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 just makes slaves of us all because very soon no one is going to do anything interesting or say anything controversial ever because you know, they'll just be so frightened that when they then become a you know court you know, high court judge for 500 years later someone will dredge up something they said on snapchat when they were 12 and that'll be the end of them mm. and this is just an insane way to live our world our lives we can't be like this it's crazy we must be allowed to make mistakes and people must be given second chances i mean the idea that that uh, who was that chap the other day you were telling me about who's now apparently a sex pest Oh, um, you mean um, Morgan Freeman? How can Morgan Freeman be a sex pest? I, I mean, he's a hero. He's God. He's God. He is the voice I of mean, God. To be honest, if I was sex pest by Morgan Freeman, I would just be so excited and delighted. I, I, you know, I'd have to dine out on it for the next twenty years. I mean, the whole idea that these women in Hollywood—this is the other thing that annoys me—are these hashtags. There's living your life by a hashtag. Hashtag this. Hashtag that. Hashtag this. Life is not a hashtag. It's much more complicated than that. You can't reduce the entire, you know, male sex to a hashtag, which is what it tries to do and it, it's it's just so reductive and simplistic and it's also so fascistic because it says if you don't 100% agree with what I say I'm going to come out there and I'm going to take you down and I'm going to ruin your life and that's what's happened to Roseanne and that's what's happened to lots and lots and lots of people but Toby Young is a case in point because here's a boy who's a boy I should say man who has spent the last 10 years of his life basically improving education for really disadvantaged children on a number of levels and he, you know, he's 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 pilloried because of a few admittedly quite offensive things he said. But I've said, you know, we've all said offensive things. Yeah, quite offensive. I mean, the thing about Toby, I've... Looked, they're just words, after all. I've looked on, on, on his later career with a, a mix of admiration and... Mild, mild disgust. The admiration is obvious in, in that what Toby's done is, is fantastic. He's, he's reinvented himself as a very serious person, doing great work, mm. really good work for good causes, mm. actually really improving the education in this, in this, mm. in this country, setting up great schools. Yeah. Fantastic. My only, the, the mild disdain part is, yeah, Toby, but you're becoming very establishment. You're yeah. not that kind of rock and roll yeah. figure anymore. Um, but I thought, well, maybe that's the price you've got to pay if you want to go in the Lords. And look what's happened. Look at how the system has rewarded with him. It's shat all over yeah. him for, for nothing. For nothing. For just... You know, and it's de- the other thing is it forgets that these people are people, are humans. I mean, Toby is a man with a wife and four children. You know, don't forget that they, they suffer too. And the, the thing that I hate so much about this trolling and this nastiness on Twitter is that it's not that they just want to destroy you. No, it's not that they just want to give you a bad time. They don't want to just pull you up because of the one thing that you've said. They actually want to destroy you completely because of one thing. And then when they finish destroying you, they want to destroy your family and your friends, and then they want to take down your pets. And th- the whole thing is just so horrible. They want to cut horrible. your head off and yeah. shit in your neck. And I it, mean- it is literally, I mean, it is like the Spanish Inquisition. It's, 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 it's driven by this inherent belief that they are the righteous ones and that what they say and what they think is correct and right and that anybody who doesn't agree with them is wrong and therefore not just not just someone they disagree with but someone who is morally wrong and therefore must be eliminated. I want to dig into this in the next section um, because I think it's it's, it's fascinating the, the kind of the mindset, the Welt and Schaung of, of the people who, who do this. So you're listening to the Dellingpole podcast with me, James Dellingpole, and my very special and wonderful and very probably fragrant, literally fragrant guest, Sarah Vine. More in a moment. Breitbart News Daily with Alex Marlowe. Jeannie in Pennsylvania. I think he's gotten away from what we really hired him to do, which is draining the swamp. If you look at the real picture of draining a swamp, you go in and you take all the water out of it. What sure. does it leave? It leaves the gunk. He cannot mm. get rid of the gunk. We have to get rid of the gunk. Everything he's doing, he's lowering the water so we can see who needs to go. The only way they can go is if we boat them out. Breitbart News Daily. Weekdays at 6 a.m. Eastern on Sirius XM Patriot 125. This is Delling Pool, a Breitbart.com podcast. Here once again is James Delling Pool. Welcome back to the Delling Pool podcast with me, James Delling Pool, and my very special and very lovely guest, Sarah Vine. We were talking about the the people that the Twitter mob, um, and there's something particularly nasty, isn't there, about the uh, 
the mob on Twitter. And I have a theory, and you can correct me if you think I'm I'm wrong. But it seems to me most of the nastiness, the really vicious nastiness, comes from the left rather than the right. I don't know. I don't get any right-wing trolling, so no. I wouldn't know. I mean, maybe people do. Maybe there are horrid right-wing trolls out there. But I think there's an interesting thing that has happened in the world, which is that the right are trying to be nicer and the left are being more and more horrid. And there's a thing, it's very strange, because when I was growing up, I always thought of the left politically as being the nice people who cared about the poor and the underprivileged and all of that sort of stuff. And then the right was sort of, you know, fox hunting and all of that kind of stuff. So like, it was, like that's a bad thing. Well, Sarah. that's obviously evil. Um, but now the left have become um, have become unashamedly vicious and aggressive and indeed are being encouraged to be vicious and aggressive. Um, Corbynistas, etc. Um, whereas the right are trying very hard to be, I think, quite rational and quite sort of calm and sensible. Um, and it may be because in this country particularly we don't really have a middle ground anymore because the Lib Dems have sort of evaporated in a puff of smoke. Mm. But it's interesting that um, people like John McDonnell and, you know, uh, Corbyn seem to do nothing to stop um, bigotry in their own party. The anti-Semitism. The anti-Semitism thing. And, you know, John McDonnell is frequently photographed, you know, at marches with people wearing ISIS, waving ISIS flags and that kind of stuff. And they don't seem to, you know, I mean, if that were a right-wing politician, they would go, they would bend over backwards to disassociate themselves from that kind of behaviour. But the left seem not, they don't seem that, that bothered by it, weirdly. Whereas the right are trying more and more to be, you know, if you look at the if you look at the Conservative Party in this country, you know, they're trying to improve schools. They're trying to improve. Uh, you know, they, they, there's a whole sort of narrative that is almost turning the sort of characters, the the characteristics of political parties on its head a bit. Twitter, because it's predominantly left, has that self righteous, um, you know, we are right sort of tone to it we are right the, the left and, the other, and the other side exactly. are, are, are evil yes. they're not they're not just and wrong but they're actually yes. and it's the it's the, it, what they do is they dehumanize their whole thing and it's it's again it's very much like when it's like germany with the jews they try to dehumanize the object of their hatred so that it makes people it makes it easier for people to then kill them or be cruel to them or do bad things to them have you ever come across um graham Lennon? Oh yes, I have. Yeah. Yes. Oh, he's he's. Yes. I'd, I'd say he's the embodiment of, th of that thing that yes. you're describing. It. And here is a guy who wrote one of the funniest sitcoms yes. of, of our lifetime. Father Ted co-wrote yes. it. Yeah. And he's sort of reinvented himself as a, a Twitter avenger, a social yes. justice warrior. And one of the things he loves to do is to demonize his opponents and make them look yeah he doesn't he doesn't go for their arguments he goes for the man yes 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 ad hominem yeah and it's very unpleasant being yeah. at the receiving end of one of his attacks because of you're course. thinking he doesn't actually think i'm a human being no that i don't have feelings and stuff no well that i mean i've often ha i've often felt that you know um in a wider context both being the wife wife of a conservative politician and also of somebody who was for, for those who don't know on the podcast i'm married to michael gove um who is a who is a tory politician yeah i mean quite I quite quite, so, quite, quite, he? quite high up he's in he's in the cabinet and stuff, he's in so the he's... cabinet yes he's he's deaf he's the minister for department of rural affairs but also a leading proponent of brexit and that really was uh, a dirty war i have to say a dirty war to you end all dirty wars. you lost friends how many friends did you lose lots Really? I mean, you Lots. did, didn't you? Yes, what? properly. Yes, properly. We, we we have people who we used to see a lot of who we now see nothing of. Who used to go on holiday with, yes. even. Yes. Isn't that weird? Very it's like, it's, it's uh, It reminds me of the of France in the war between those who were resistant yes. and those who were collaborators, yes. uh, apparently. Th well, that's the division. It's very sad. I mean, I, I never saw... I, I, I don't understand how a simple vote about whether or not to stay in an economic union got so complicated and so nasty but it did yeah <laughs> um but so going back to sort of the dehumanization thing i mean during that debate you know there were moments when it felt as though people genuinely 
did not view me and Michael as human beings and that we were just sort of kind of demonized really to, to, to a sort of point of being eliminated as people, as normal people. And of course it extends also to your family. You know, it's very difficult that that's one of the most difficult things as a, as a person who has an involvement in public life is the, is what it does to your kids. And that's really tough. Because How do you, of course yeah, they feel it as well. They do. But because because uh, my my kids have had had this experience probably to a lesser extent, but I but I know that there have been times at schools I'm not naming any names where my children have been persecuted because of who their father is. Yeah, and and I'm sure sure yours have had the same. Yeah, yeah. I mean the schools are brilliant at protecting them, and they do protect them very well. But I think there is always. I mean, there's a limit to what to what adults can do in in that context. And I mean, it doesn't help when ridiculous newspapers like the Sunday Mirror splash on your own child and don't respect any of the laws of I couldn't believe, when you told me that story I, I, I couldn't quite believe that yeah. that actually happened I, how is that not illegal well I don't know <laughs> don't or know. at least against all the conventions <laughs> yes well we tried very hard but they didn't they weren't going to listen um, and you know other other newspapers write ridiculous stories about uh, you know us and our kids and our friends and stuff um, <clears throat> I think the problem is you just have to suck it up that's my general view now, which is that you have to suck it up. Yeah, yeah. And also to be kind of self-pitying, which I don't think is a thing that we really do. No, I mean, you know, you, we've brought it to ourselves. And also... I mean, we've only got ourselves to blame. And we could have... I mean, I could have just had a nice job as a banker. You could have married somebody somebody nice rather than somebody evil. Exactly, yes. <laughs> but do you not think, in a teeny tiny way, I've, I've looked at the effect it's had on my children and it's kind of toughened them it's up. It's good, yeah. And given them a sort yeah. of very grown-up view they of the have world. A very inter- they have, my children have a very interesting view of the world. And they are surprisingly um, resilient. To yes, use the fashionable word. They are. They are surprisingly. I mean, I don't know. They might suddenly go mad when they're third, when they're twenty or something. And I obviously I'm putting a lot of money aside for psychiatric bills. When they go postal and when just they take go, out, you yeah. you feel a bit guilty about that. Um, but um, no, I think you can't really complain about it. But you can observe it and you can comment on it. And it is, um, it is very, uh, it is very interesting how how easy people find how, how easily people will, will reduce you to um a non-human it's like it's like the, um yeah. the stormer yeah it's you you are a kind of a jew with your with your hook nose and your your grasping hands i mean that's how we yeah, are that portrayed. Sort of, yes yeah and yeah i but i i think this division has always been with us i think that i think that the world divides into Puritans, if you like, and yeah. and whatever we are, non-Puritans, and yeah. the Puritans, because they have, because because they're morally right, yeah. they feel that we are, we should be exterminated. Really, I yeah. mean, we either convert to their religion, we adopt yeah. the cause of social justice, or we deserve to burn in hellfire. I mean, moral certainty is a scary thing, isn't it? Yeah, and there's a lot of it about. And and it, it seems to be getting worse. I mean, the internet a- amplifies everything, and it's it, it amplifies lots of good things, but it also amplifies lots of bad as- aspects of human nature. And I think this is one of the worst aspects that it tends to. It seems particularly good at enlarging beyond all sensible levels. One of the things I think you're quite good at, one of the many things you're quite good at, Sarah, is um, because you're a bit foreign. Bit foreign. Um, but European. You, yeah, exactly. You yeah. were brought up in Italy. Euro trash. And I think that to an extent, you sort of can think outside. Well, I, I think I find, um, I still find Britain a little alien in terms of its culture. I mean, I grew up in Italy and in France and my family are spread out throughout Italy, France and Spain. And so I spend a lot of time in Europe. And in fact, that's one of the reasons I voted Brexit because... I've seen what the EU has done to Italy and anyone looking at Italy today and the basket case that it has become can see uh, why if you were Italian, you would not be particularly in favour of the European Union. You'd be voting for Five Star or or the Northern (laughs) Well, it's not a great choice to have. I mean, we have now in Italy a political polarisation that is basically a choice between one group of nutters and another group of nutters. Um, Italy is bankrupt. It has no... um, 
you know, it's got, it's, it, it's had no help. It's, it has enormous amounts of economic migrants coming into the country, but they can't get out because all the other so-called um, allied countries have shut their borders. So Italy is a basket case and it is, I would say, pretty much entirely the fault of the EU. So that is really why I voted for Brexit because I've seen, and also Spain is another case, that is another country that's done very badly in the EU. I mean, these, these sort of second tier e economies in Europe were never going to flourish in the EU. And, you know, Italy not being able to devalue its own currency has created a huge problem for that country. Yeah. Um, but that's a very long, complicated discussion. But that is why I, one of the reasons I voted Brexit. Um, people are often astonished because of the fact that I have such strong contacts with, with, with Europe that I would vote Brexit. But what I would like to say is that people conflate the EU with Europe. The two are not the same no. thing. And it's, it's, you know, every time someone says to me, oh, but you know, we are all Europeans. Yes, we are all Europeans. We do not all have to belong to the EU. Europe is not the same as the EU. And I just wish people would say that more often. You know, the EU is a constructed, unelected organisation dreamt up by Germany and France to make their lives easier. <laughs> and, uh, and it's not the same as Europe. Europe is a lovely place and it's beautiful. And in fact, we are here now in France. Yeah. Um, but I, but um, I forgot what the question was. And it's was. bloody raining. And it's bloody raining, yeah, which, which, is, which is ridiculous. Is shit, right? yeah. And, and that, I mean, that is probably the actually EU. Actually pouring. E I'm, I, yeah. EU's yeah. fault. I don't think. It, I don't believe it didn't rain in in France in late May no. before the EU came. It'll on. be some quota. Yeah, definitely. some quota. So, how did the Italian middle so, class survive? I mean, have you noticed a, a, a reduction in quality of life and stuff? Yes, the Italians. The Italians are. I'd say the 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 country is in a sort of advanced state of collective depression. I mean, the Italians. I mean, the Italians are pretty pretty un, you know, hard to suppress and they are bon viveurs um but italy used to be a a very optimistic if slightly chaotic i mean always very corrupt unfortunately you know that's just how it is yeah. country but it was a good place to live and it was fun you know la vita era bella yeah. and it's not so much the case anymore i think people find that um you know, there's no other no, nothing to do nothing for anyone to do and even the italians who are generally speaking quite you know lazy they do like to do something you know it's very difficult there are no you know there's very little work um it's 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 tiresome and property i mean you can't give away property in italy now I mean, really? it's worth nothing i mean and, it's it's such a shame to see such a beautiful country so so on its uppers. Well, also you think about it was within our lifetime, almost within our lifetime, um, La Dolce Vita. Yes, and all that. The, the, yes. the idea that, that that Italy was the centre. Well, I mean, the of reason my parents moved to Italy in the first place in the seventies was because they went there on a long weekend. Um, I think when I was a baby, and they loved it so much, they decided they were going to do everything in their power to go and live in Rome. And they just went to live in Rome, lived in Rome. They didn't speak a word of Italian. The Italians were lovely. They, they, I don't know, my dad got a job. I don't think my mother worked. I went to the local school. Um, you know, it was, it was an adventure and they've never come back. Um, and it is a wonderful, wonderful country. And it's very different. I mean, I think, I don't really know why I came back to the UK, but I think I came back to the UK because fundamentally I'm an Anglo-Saxon and I quite like the order and rigor of Britain. I like the sort of kind of cultural neatness of the Brits. Yeah. You know, um, rules. There are rules in England and I, I quite like rules. Even but you quite it, like breaking them I as well. I like to break them, yeah. but I like to have them to break. Whereas in Italy, there aren't that many rules to begin with. And I think that, yeah, I think, I think that, but I always see, I always see the Brits as, I always, I always feel this tiny little bit disassociated, which is why I think, which I think helps me when I'm writing the column because you know, I'm always looking at the world slightly from outside. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah. not, I'm not really in the bubble. I'm sort of outside of the bubble looking in. Mm. Do, do you think that you're, um, as a parent, you are a typical English parent or a, a foreign parent, as I would call it? I think I'm quite a foreign parent. Yeah. Yes, I'm very, well, I have been accused of being rather slack. No. Yes, by you, James. <laughs> So but, you might but, wish to explain no, to your but, podcasters. But can I say, I was saying it admiringly. I was, I, I think the phrase I used was, I, I'm glad to see you're quite a laissez-faire parent. Laissez-faire. And, and I myself, I'm a laissez-faire parent, particularly where daughters are concerned. 
I think like a lot of fathers, we're just yeah. actually in our daughter's hands. And yes. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I yes. mean, they are our little... I just, I just don't, princess. I just, I just don't think I have any ownership over my children particularly. I mean, my job is to sort of keep them alive yeah. and give them some basic values to live their life by. But I don't. I mean, it's not up to me whether they cut their hair or not. No, or what? Actually, the thing I've I've realised is that, or what they study, or no, whether they go to university, or whether they decide that they want to give it all up and go and live in a yurt or join a band. It's their life, you know. Yeah. And it's theirs to be lived. It's not mine. You know, I think I feel very strongly about that. And my, I think I get that from my parents. My parents have always respected my privacy and they've always respected my decisions. They may not have agreed with me about a lot of things. And in fact, they don't. But they've always respected my decision. And they've always said, OK, that's fine. That's not what we would do. We, and they quite often say that's not what we would do. But they will not try and stop me yeah. they've never tried to stop me from doing anything even when they've thought it was the worst possible stupidest thing i could ever do because their view has always been it's your life you learn by your mistakes we will be here we're here for you we'll help you if you need to be helped we'll pick you up if you need to be picked up but you need to experience this stuff in order to learn and i feel like that about my children so um one of the reasons i don't send my children to private school is because i don't want them to feel obliged to me in any way for their education I want to feel that they can be absolutely free to make the choices they make. So I'm not going to choose my daughter's A-levels for her. She'll choose what she wants to do. And if she wants to do a crazy combination of DT and politics or whatever it is that she she's currently talking about doing, that's fine. That's yeah. up to her. It's, it's you know, they don't owe me anything. Yeah. Can, well, mind you, can I correct one misapprehension there? Even when you do sell them, send them to private school, they don't show... <laughs> <laughs> tiniest bit of gratitude they don't even notice well it's, it's their just, reality it's just isn't it? whatever yeah exactly this is how it is yeah yeah, yeah. this is how it is but also children. i think as a children of politicians of a politician i think it's quite useful to be in the real world when you're growing up because it'll make your life much easier later on i think you know you need to and my both of my children have experienced um a degree of hostility on account of their parents and they've learned to deal with it at a time when it's easier to do. I mean, I think younger children find these things easier to deal with, don't they? Yeah, yeah. So they're sort of, you know, they're, they're coping. I, I think, think we've just about... I think we've bloody spoiled the bastards because... I, look, Your children. Well, I mean... My uh, children all, are not spoiled. Both, no, no. What I mean is in the sense of the, of the people that they get to meet. They take for oh, granted yeah. that, yeah. that you, you, you hang out with cabinet yes. ministers, with, with yes. stars, with... You know, this is normal. And it's not for most. No, that in that respect they are spoiled. Yes, my children are spoiled in that respect. And they should. But I kind of see. I see that as a perk of having to bear the bear the bear the burden of, of of having two very annoying parents who make their lives very unpleasant. At some you know sometimes, is that they get these little advantages, which is that they do get to sort of meet a footballer that they like, or or go to you know. A concert that they like yes like they, their godfather is didier drogba yeah which which he isn't it's actually. not no, no it's not but he, but he no. might be yeah he, i mean it if he's if he's listening i you know the post is open i'd quite like didier drogba as my godfather actually yes Yes, is he, he's a footballer, right? Yeah, he is. No, he yes, is. He, I'm not very good yeah, on oh, footballers. He's, oh, he's wonderful. He's, he was just the most exciting. He's kind of lazy ass, and then he suddenly pulls out, out you know, half a dozen goals out of the hat. And, yes. and just... Can we not talk about football? No, no. I'm, that was the end of the football conversation. Okay, uh, you're listening to, by the way, next section, we're going to do this thing that I don't often have. This is not because I'm a sexist, not just because I'm a sexist pig, but I don't have that many women on the, on the podcast. And you can explain to me women's psych psychopathology to do with me too that's what we're going to talk about next okay. you're listening to the Dellingpole podcast with me james Dellingpole, and my very special and very lovely and very female guest and very very foreign as well or quite foreign <laughs> guest sarah vine what a moment Right part news tonight with Joel Pollack and Rebecca Mansour. A lot of people not knowing what action they could or should take to make the difference. What I do is try to turn people on to sites like Breitbart, you know, people who are writing and publishing the truth so that people will get educated. But, you know, you kind of can't blame productive members of society who are kind of confused, perplexed as to what do we do to take this government back. Sirius XM Patriot Channel 125. This is Delling Pole, a Breitbart.com podcast. Here once again is James Delling Pole. Welcome back to the Delling Pole podcast with me, James Delling Pole, and my very special, 
very womanly. This is this is key. Guest, Sarah Vine. Sarah, I think as a man, I find your sex completely away with it. You are balmy. You are psychopaths. You are dangerous. I mean, you're very lovely. I, I adore you. You're, you're, you're great at multitasking and cooking and making us all feel, making our homes lovely and all sorts of clever things. But my God, do you not think things have gone too far? Your sex has gone, or gender as some of your lot call it, is completely out of control. Yes, I think that's very much um, a bit of a problem. I think, um, but although I, can, I just say, can I just say that I don't think you'll find that issue so much with women over the age of 40 i think it's young no. women who've gone a bit mad i think yeah I think they're all kind of in their 20s and 30s the mad ladies um the hashtag me too is i assume is what you're talking I, about it's one of the things yes yeah. yes yes um it's very strange isn't it um uh the idea that any male attention is now some form of um uh sexual microaggression that seems to be the general gist of things um i I've written about hashtag me too and how stupid and reductive I think it is. I think it's very anti-feminist. I think the idea that you can't um, slap a man and tell him to piss off if he's, yes. if he's generally invading your space is ridiculous. I think retrospective sexual accusations are also ridiculous. I mean, how can you possibly... I can't even remember what I had for breakfast yesterday, let alone whether somebody, um, you know, made an inappropriate comment about my dress 25 years ago. I have no way of knowing that. <laughs> um, how do you prove any of this stuff? And also, more importantly, perspective. I always think, ladies, perspective. You know, um, if you want to do something about uh, male oppression and aggression, uh, there are plenty of places in the world where appalling things happen to women all the time. Uh, you know, the Yazidi women, Boko Haram and the and the girls they can. There's so many causes you could adopt or get involved with that are so very valid and so serious. But I just think, you know, someone saying you look nice in, nice in a dress and then that being some kind of hashtag me too sort of thing is absurd and completely ridiculous and it's really awful because it diminishes the genuine suffering of women who are being raped and tortured on a daily basis it diminishes their suffering because you're saying that you with your slight pat on the bottom are somehow equivalent to a Yazidi girl who has been raped every day for the last three years yeah. and you're just not but, You're just not. But to be fair, Sarah, some of these these um, actresses had to turn up to award ceremonies in 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 dresses in only one one tone. I know. I mean, that's I, suffering, isn't it? That, yeah. I mean, the idea that any woman doesn't want to wear a black dress, that, that a woman <laughs> wearing a black dress is somehow a torture, is ridiculous. I and mean, if they had turned up in the uh, to the Oscars in you know, sackcloth and ashes or bin bags, I would have had a little bit of time with for them. With their head shaven, yes. like, like Cersei, exactly. done the exactly. walk of shame. Yes, fine. Then you're, then I've got, then yes, actually you are making a statement. Um, but to turn up in a Versace black dress. Costing uh, only. Costing only 12 million pounds with your tits on show. is not, <laughs> I'm sorry. It's just so irrational. And can they not see how craven they look? They're just jumping on a bandwagon. Also, I hate the idea that you try to reduce women's suffering to a hashtag. It's not a hashtag. It can't. You can't. It can't be a hashtag. There's. There's nothing that can that can express the true misery of a Yazidi girl or someone who's been kidnapped by Boko Haram and forced into marriage and slavery. You can't. You can't encapsulate that in a word or a hashtag. Yeah. It's so much more complex than that. Can, can I say something sexist at this point? Go on. Um, well, I have a theory on this, which is that I think women are more or less the superior species. I mean, you are fantastic. I love you totally. And and having daughters makes me realize just how special you are. And I love my mother and my mm. sister and all that. And all the women I've shagged and my wife, obviously. I think she's brilliant. Um, women are amazing. But God seems to have given them a particular flaw. Well, it's a bit like the, the, the Persian carpet, isn't it? With, with the tiny flaw, which, which shows that they're not better than God. And the flaw that women have is that they always bloody whinge about their condition. They always feel put upon by men. It's not fair. 
and this has gone gone on through the ages and, and Shakespeare wrote a play about it called The Taming of the Shrew and, and you see it in Chaucer and stuff. They're always they're always whinging. Why now has this been weaponized to destroy civilization? Has it ever occurred to you that we only do that to make you feel better about your own inadequacies, Daniel? Well, <laughs> I don't know how do I feel about that. Yeah, but look, I, 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 it's not that I mind about why you do it or, or, or no, how awful joking. we are. But, but why? Because this is creating a rupture within our civilization where women are turning against men who after all are not a bad thing i i i completely i completely agree with you it is totally irrational but i don't think it's all women i think that there's a sort of i think there's a sort of weird little blip that's going on i I don't i there are always women who are always going to complain about their lot in life but i think most women um most sort of you know the, the silent majority are perfectly happy and normal side. and kind of love men and get irritated with them but don't, don't doesn't mean they hate them i i think that there's just a i think there is such a thing as collective hysteria and i think that's what's happening in hollywood at the moment yeah but, but, i okay. mean let's just talk about the harvey weinstein thing yeah i mean he's obviously a, a sort of bit of a revolting man and he's a, a, perv. Of a, a bit of a perv yeah. um we've all had encountered pervs in our in our professional lives as women the thing is, in Hollywood, he just happened to be a perv who made all the good movies. So as an actress, you had a choice. Either I'm going to be in his movies and I'm going to have to do the pervy things or I'm not and I'm not going to get involved. Plenty of actresses made that latter choice and didn't get involved with him at all. Angelina Jolie never made any of his movies because she didn't want to do that stuff. What I mean is, is that in life, there are transactions. Yeah. And sometimes you think, well... I don't like that. I don't want to do it. But it'll get me somewhere I want to go. And as a woman, you might choose to use your attractiveness to get to what you want to. There's no shame in that. But don't turn around 20 years later and say it was abuse. But you know what, Sarah? I think that's really, even now, that's really brave of you to say that because most women are not saying this shit or, or at least most people, women in the public eye because they want their time in the limelight in their black dresses making us feel sorry for them. Maybe there are plenty of women in Hollywood who have been genuinely abused, but Hollywood is a transactional place. You know, you don't go and have a career in Hollywood thinking it's going to be rainbows and unicorns. And the per- But when you do get the rainbows and unicorns, it's pretty oh, yeah. great. Yeah. Right. And let's not forget, the year before Weinstein was outed as a, as a pervert, which it would appear he undoubtedly is, they were all sitting there at the Oscars applauding him. He was sitting in their midst... T- and they all, they all knew. They were all putting their arms around mm. and saying, oh, my lovely Harvey. And there are loads of pictures of people cuddling up to him. I mean, sorry, what, what's changed? Yeah. What's changed is that, is that now everyone knows. Yeah. But they're all hypocrites because so many of them knew what the score was and still went for it. I think that the idea... I mean, I'm no, I have no doubt that he's, he's a nasty bad man, but he was a nasty bad man for the last 20, 30 yeah. years in Hollywood. Mm. So if he was, why didn't someone speak up sooner? What, what, why this sort of acquiescence? Yeah. Oh, because I tell you why. Because he made great movies and they wanted to be in his great movies. Yeah. Okay, so let's not lie about this. You know, you can, you can turn around and say 20 years later, actually, you know what, I did some stuff with Harvey Weinstein that I probably shouldn't have done because I really wanted to be in his movies. And actually, I think now, I think I'm a bit ashamed of myself. That is completely acceptable and fine. But... You cannot pretend that this stuff, you know, has come out of the blue and that he's this monster who's suddenly been discovered because he's not a monster that's suddenly been discovered. Everybody knew about Weinstein. Even I knew about Weinstein and I don't even have any friends. I mean, literally, even I knew about Weinstein. Yeah, yeah. And I remember interviewing an actress, actually, in the lobby of some Swiss hotel in London. She was very bored having to be interviewed by me. I think she was promoting some lipstick because, you know, they all have these contracts with you know, L'Oreal and all these companies pay these actresses a fortune to wear their makeup and stuff. And it's a very nice little earner for them because they don't really have to do anything. You know, they get to do... Except talk to Sarah Vine Except talk to me, yeah. obviously, in a lobby, yes. in a lobby, which is very, very boring for them. And, and Harvey Weinstein walked past and you, this woman basically transformed from incredibly bored person just literally phoning it in to full-on, you know, gusher armour, here I am, I'm fabulous, I'm on, you know. Because he was powerful and he made the movies everyone wanted to be in. 
Because you do do those tricks, don't you, you girls? I mean, you yeah. do. It is oh, yeah. part of your battery of yes. techniques. I don't think there's any... I think that, uh, you know... Being pretty and attractive to, to you know to men is a is 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 a string to someone's bow. I mean, it's not thing I have. But you, you, know. well, you, you were saying it's it's not a good thing, or it is. A good it is thing. a good thing. Yeah, we'd all wish it's it part for of our, your power. our girls, isn't it? It's part of your power as a woman. Yeah, I mean, look at Cleopatra. Look at all these women in history. You know, they used their sexual power. There's nothing wrong with using your sexual power to get where you want. Yeah. Why is that suddenly a bad thing? But okay, so it doesn't, isn't, isn't that the ultimate feminist triumph? Being able to use your sexual power to get what you want. But re- rewinding, uh, you you say that these people are a, a, a minority. That that actually most male readers, for example, most women over forty all know it's nonsense, and, and lots of women under forty mm. know it's nonsense. So how come it's achieved this grip over our culture? Who? I mean, part, because part most women over forty are too busy to go on Twitter and make a gigantic fuss. Right. So, so the, the mistake we've made is listening to Twitter. Yeah, well, basically, most people over forty, most women over forty, have got kids and husbands and jobs yeah. and lives and stuff that they need to do, dogs that need to be walked, and things that need to happen in their lives, and they just don't have the bandwidth. And also, they to... probably want men to lecture over them, like the way. That <laughs> Well, you know, I mean, the, this idea that women are sort of, I mean, what I hate so much about this whole Hollywood Me Too hashtag Time's Up, whatever it's called thing, is that it is just, it just, it just paints women as kind of defenceless, poor little victims of of sort of great, big, scary men. And it's really not the case. Or, or what? I mean, really not you women case. are in charge and I mean, you always bloody have it's only, I mean, it's not, it's, it, they are, you know, it's a sort of, it's a kind of little sort of, it's a sort of, I don't know, it's a sort of sleeping beauty fantasy, isn't it? It's this idea that, oh, we're all just sort of lying around waiting to be importuned by men. I mean, we're not at all. And and, and that's the thing. It, 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 it victimises women in a way that I just think is completely embarrassing as a female of the species. I think it's really embarrassing that you should attempt to sort of, that you should allow yourself to be victimised in this way. I mean, there are women who are victims of men. I don't want to live in a world where where Morgan Freeman is no longer the voice of God and where I can't watch The Usual Suspects because Kevin Spacey is now the perv of all pervs mm. and where you can't even... You know, my favourite... One of my favourite artists... But when did everything become so censorious? Yes. When did we all become so afraid of our sexual desires? I mean... Because sex is quite rude, isn't it? It's, it's quite naughty. Yes, but isn't it one of the great joys of being alive? Well, totally, totally. That's it. But but uh, so, suddenly been, everyone's discovered that sex is so naughty that you can't you can't even. Well, it's sort of almost being criminalised. Yeah. You know, and and expressing any sort of appreciation of the female form is now a sort of thought crime. It's horrible. Yeah. I mean. You know, and it goes. I mean, but and also it's so ridiculous because if, if a woman says four, look at the you know bottom on that no one's going to accuse her of being a sex pest but if a man so says women the same, say they say no, they don't. The bottom on no, that. They, they don't, don't. Say what, that. how do they say it? i don't know what they say i don't say are that you are you censoring yourself now I because am. in case yeah. but you know if you sort of um, it, it, it's just it's just this idea that men are all predatory sort of feral beasts and women are all swimming swooning maidens seems to be what all these so-called young feminists are promoting and you couldn't have a a less feministic view of the world, really, could you? Well, also... It's sort of Victorian. Is it not true of, of, of women that one moment's unwelcome pass is the next moment's actually rather enjoyable... Yes, sudden yes. sort of come oh, definitely. On? I think I think there's definitely a sort of tension there between the sort of, you know, the, the inner kind of, ooh, no, ooh, and then the sort of... You know, that's how it works, isn't it? I mean... Well, but, look at Fifty Shades of Grey, which, yes. which, which no one will talk about. Women are complex sexual beings, and so are yeah. men. And, yeah. and I think that, you know, those sort of... Uh, you know, I think what people... Uh, that will never change. But the idea that you somehow now recast this as a sort of, uh, as with the men as the sort of eternal aggressor is just is just ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, and 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 frightening. I was I was going to say also if you want equality in the workplace, which women do and which I'm very much in favour of, you have to be able to rub along with your male counterparts without making them 
I mean, I work in quite a sex, I, you know, my business journalism used to be quite a sexist environment. But in all the years that I worked there, I never once felt threatened by the sort of banter. I mean, I think you have to sort of understand the difference between male banter, which is, you know, a bit, a bit sort of leery. Yeah. But broadly speaking, quite complimentary and not necessarily malicious. And someone who is persistently trying to get you to do stuff that you don't want to do. And it seems to me that a lot of women these days, they can't distinguish between the two. It is a very high calling being, for a woman to be good at banter, is we respect you mm. so much. Because it, it, it puts you on the level mm. with us. Mm. Mm. And if you, can't, if you can't do the banter, well then, fuck off. Yeah. Don't, don't whinge about it. Yeah. Um, the, the, the artist I, I wanted to mention briefly, Chuck Close. Do you ever come across him? No. Chuck Close... Classic sort of 1970s, 80s, photorealist article, uh, artist in a, in a wheelchair. Um, brilliant. I, I, I went to see his retrospective at, I think it was the Haywood a few, a few years back. And I, I, I thought I'd love to earn Chuck Close. Really good. Chuck Close, he's, old, he's older now, still in his wheelchair, obviously. I think he was uh, recruiting girls to act as his model, paying them a few hundred... Uh, dollars here and there and he he made leery remarks and letterous remarks as probably you would if you're a an old bloke in a wheelchair yeah. and he's had all his exhibitions cancelled you know the nazis of the of the art establishment have decided that he's going to be airbrushed out of history well i mean that's i mean but that's what i mean when i said earlier on in the podcast about the grown-ups taking all this stuff far too seriously mm. you know companies and uh, you know people uh, it's up to us to say no to this stuff. You just, you know, you just have to say no to it. Well, up to you and me, but we've, well, we've no, said no. Well, no, up to the grown-ups in the world, up to the people who run the companies, who own the businesses, who run the art world, to say, don't be so ridiculous, dear. Your job is taking your clothes off in front of a, a man in a wheelchair. What do you expect? Mm. But do you not think <laughs> that what we know of the lovers in the arts establishment, we know that they're, they're, they're completely lost because they're all of that, kind of lib left liberal mindset but he in even in the corporations which ought to be more robust because after all the business of business is paper business, chase paper chase i can't remember why they did something what was it they paper chased um they there was a campaign against them by was it they advertised in the daily mail that's right oh they advertised in the daily brings mail. brings us full circle for the crime of advertising yes. in a newspaper which yes. isn't the guardian yes this yes. campaign group decided that they should be yes. denuded of all advertising yes. and, or, or, of all by custom. the way the daily mail that is basically run by women i mean genuinely and read by women i mean it is run by women i mean we are we we kind of well i mean we you know we listen to men a bit you yeah. know we give them we let them have their say yeah. and then we just go away and do what we were going to do anyway you know the, have you read the wife of bath tale did you yes you, yeah I did. So you remember the key thing at the end Love of the, the wife of Bath. The, the wife of Bath Tale at the end, what it is that women most want. And it's it's basically to be given autonomy and, and to, to, to run the show yes. from behind the scenes. Yes, yes. That's what they yes. want. Yes, we're very happy for the men to go out there and do their posturing or whatever it is that they do, their man mansplaining. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but as long as we can be allowed to get on with, you know, running things. Do you not think that part of the culpability lies with the people I call manginas or probably more technically <laughs> man, mangini the kind of men who describe themselves any Is man who, men with angina men who call themselves feminists <laughs> any man who calls himself a feminist is has got to be a weapons grade tit hasn't he um just say yes no i I'm disagree right. with you oh, on that James. oh don't look look feminine we can love women and not be a feminist no you can no a man can be a feminist in that he can believe that women have the right to do exactly what they want to do in Order their lives. I, look, Sarah, Sarah, you can't, you can't like I can't disagree Ma with you. Mangina. No, but mangina, is, I don't like the word mangina. That's why I use the word, because it insults <laughs> them greatly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, then. we just, okay, before we go, who do we blame? And how do we stop? Now, how do we stop it? That's more important. We just all switch off to our devices and don't go on social media and it'll all go away. Is, is it that simple? <laughs> yeah, it's that well, you simple. Think, you think, you think, so, so you mean if we switch off our devices... Just don't give them the oxygen and publicity. But do you think Morgan Freeman's ever going to be God again? He won't yeah, be. Yeah, he'll always be God in my mind. Yeah, but in our mind, but we're old and we're, and we're past it. We're, that's it. Yeah, but so is he, to be honest. 
Yeah. I mean, he's quite old. Isn't it awful, though, that his, his twilight years I mean, be in spent... some ways, you have to say, this is not our world anymore. This is their world. If they want to turn it into this, they want to ruin this it. place. If they want to ruin it, it's fine. It's up to them. They'll they'll discover that they're wrong eventually and they'll come around to the right way of thinking. When they all get to the, when they all get to the age of 40 and they realise that basically no one ever says they look nice in a dress again at all. And they just think, wow, when I was 20 and all those people were saying I look nice in a dress, <laughs> I got really upset and took them to court. And now I'm 40 and I literally can't can't get run over in the street <laughs> then they will realize the error of their ways and they'll become like you and i you've suddenly made it better for all of us old <laughs> that we, we've got the pleasure of schadenfreude even though we're going to be dead when it happens we well, know we might not be dead because we might be hanging around like bad smells oh, because yes. don't let's forget we're going to make their lives even more miserable because they're going to have to pay for us to be old and drooling oh. in our chairs yeah yeah. So, you know, I think we just need to play the long game here, James. It's it's all going to be all right in the end. Good. Thank you. Uh, you're listening to the Dellingpole podcast with me, James Dellingpole, and my brilliant guest. Thank you very much, Sarah Vine. Sunny's Corner with Sunny Johnson. Everything in hip hop is not bad. Kanye agreed with us, so let's love him today until he raps tomorrow and you turn your back. Because if you jump off when the fun of the moment is over, then you are in fact making Kanye the token he is accused of being. So please, don't do that. Don't go there. Sunny's Corner with Sunny Johnson. Saturday from 1 to 3 p.m. East on Sirius XM Patriot 125.